levitates, but it's not stable. It will fall on the floor. This is not a stable situation in type 1. But in type 2 superconductors, part of the magnetic field lines goes through the superconductor, and there they are realized as uh, vortex lines, which are pinned. So there is some dry friction, you could say. You can shift with your finger such a levitating superconducting disk, and then it will move to a new equilibrium position. And you, you can calculate the hysteresis here, the force versus uh, versus the magnetic field at this position or also versus the position. So you can calculate, in principle, such uh, hysteresis curves for levitation. And you, you can have levitation above a superconductor. This is a very big disk, five centimeters. This picture I took at home. <laughs> at the time I took uh, liquid nitrogen home, which is probably not allowed to transport by a car. And here, then I turned it around, and then the superconductor is suspending. It's because here the force is repulsive, here the force is attractive. Namely, when, when you move this disk up, then the force goes through zero and changes sign. This can be seen in principle in these, in these curves. So the force changes sign. So you can have both levitation and suspension. Ah, there, there, there should be some. Actually, it's not here. No longer here. That was a nice. No, not here. OK, so geometry is very important. Namely, when you, the, the, there is a so-called bean model. When you have a critical current density, then a very good approximation is to assume that the current inside the superconductor is either zero or has the value of JC. This was uh, proposed by Charles Bean in '61, and it's a very successful model. But uh, it was considered first only for cases with no demagnetizing effect, say for long cylinders or long slabs. And there, when you increase the field, the magnetic flux, this is a flux density or induction P, penetrates linearly, like a, like a sand heap is filled. And, when you, and, and the current density is just the derivative of this curve, so it's either JC or minus JC or zero. And when you go down with the applied field, then these profiles then look like this, so zigzag. And finally, you have just this mountain when you are at low enough values, and the current density now is a, has a zigzag, or here it has a zigzag, uh, uh, stepwise constant uh, behavior. Now, much more important are situations where you do not have a very long cylinder. There is no infinite cylinder, no infinite slab. And the bean model for, for the opposite limit, namely very thin disks and thin strips, so-called perpendicular geometry, whereas this is parallel or longitudinal geometry. This has been solved only in 93, almost at the same time by Michienko and Kusovlov from Donetsk in Ukraine and by Michael Hindenbohm and myself in Stuttgart. So it was published at a at distance of two weeks. And interestingly, this, this solution, how this current density, or this is now not exactly the same current density, it's a sheet current density. It's a current density integrated over thickness. It has this profile, so it's constant at the edge where vortices is, have penetrated, and then here in the middle where you still have no vortex penetrated, where there is no field, and where there is no field, there is a sheet current. So when you integrate over thickness, you find a current which has this curve of an arc uh, of uh, arcus sinus, for instance. And the interesting thing is that for disk and strips, this analytic function is exactly the same. But the magnetic field is known analytically only for the strip, but not for the disk. For the disk, you take this current and then just by Pio Savar law, by one integration, you, you get also the magnetic field. And it looks almost the same as for the strip, but there is no analytic solution for the uh, magnetic field in a disk in this bean model. Then I did some numerics. I wanted to see what happens when the film becomes thicker. So this is a long strip or bar 
with finite thickness or a disk with finite thickness or short cylinder. All this can be calculated. One uses Ampere's law. This is just the inverse of the Laplacian this in three dimensions. This is the green function of the Laplacian operator. This is the applied vector, vector potential from the applied field. And now you integrate either along this uh, z or z coordinate or along the angle because of symmetry you can integrate. And then for the two-dimensional bar you get now this expression. So the vector potential is given by some non-local kernel, a logarithmic function divided uh, th times the, the current density minus this vector potential of the applied current. And now you take the time derivative here and here and here and use the induction law, which means the time derivative of the vector potential is just the electric field. And the electric field, according to some model, is proportional to the current density to the nth power. This is a very realistic uh, uh, model. And when n is large, then you are close to the Bean model. And when n is smaller, you have strong flux creep, so strong thermally activated depinning. And then you discretize your problem. You know, instead of having integral, you then get sums. And you have, instead of this integral kernel, you have now a matrix, which is defined here. And the, the main problem is when i equals j, and this diverges. So the diagonal term has to be considered separately. The one has to know how to use the diagonal term. This was my main achievement. It will not work if you do not answer this question for this the diagonal term of this, um, of this uh, matrix. And then you insert, uh, insert all this here, and then you get an equation uh, here, equation for the, no, an equation where the time, time derivative of the, of the current at the position j enters a sum. This is not very practical. But when you invert this matrix, when you use the inverse matrix, you can solve this. You have just the time derivative of the current density at the position i. These are is the index of the grid points. It's just a sum over this uh, inverse matrix and then the, some, this power here of this model of the current density minus the applied vector potential or the time derivative. So this is Rembrandt times coordinate. And it's very important that this equation contains always the applied field. So you can start with zero applied field and then you just increase the applied field and integrate the current in time steps and then you get such uh, hysteretic magnetization curves. I show this here. When you have a, a thick disk in the applied field, then first when the applied field is not strong, uh, then there is only a small sheath of current penetrating. So the, and when, when you go higher with the applied field, you have this here. So the current density is 1, or uh, say minus 1 and plus 1. So the current density is constant here, and it's 0 in the, in the core, in the field and current-free core. And then when you increase the applied field more and more, the magnetic field penetrates more. And this, this dashed line is a contour line where the current is one-half Jc. So there's zero uh, plus Jc and minus Jc. And then at some time you have full penetration. Then there is no more zone in the middle. And you have these magnetic field lines. And now you go back again with the, uh, with the applied field. You decrease it. And then the current will have this form. And when you are at the remnant state, when the applied field is zero, you have just a behavior as if you had a circulating current. Like the current in the ring, it has a similar magnetic field. These are magnetic field lines. So all this can be calculated directly on a PC. Another geometry is when you have a thin rectangular uh, film, then in the, in the beginning, and, and pinning keeps the vortices out. And now you increase the applied field, then first you have the ideal Meissner state. And this is a current distribution, the current streamlines for this Meissner state. This current generates a magnetic field in this plane, which is exactly opposed to the applied field. So it's a constant magnetic field, but with sign opposite to the applied constant magnetic field. But then when you increase the applied field more and more, then 
magnetic field will penetrate. This is the contour lines of the magnetic field. And you see in this experiment at the yttrium barium copper oxide film the magnetic this magnetic op magneto optics, you see the magnetic field is in indeed penetrates from, from the sides here. And then when the the applied field is large enough when it has penetrated to the middle, then the current flows on rect concentric rectangles. This is just a beam model, namely the current density is constant everywhere, but the direction changes by all this, uh, by 90 degrees when you go around. This is a bit more complicated geometry. I have a slit and a hole in this rectangle. And now I consider three cases. This is the previous case where you apply a magnetic field. Then the current flows like this. Current cannot cross this slit because the slit is, is not conducting. It's just vacuum. This situation is different. It's a situation where the applied field is zero, but you have a trapped magnetic flux here. And this causes current to flow. But to allow this, for this, you have to have a contact here. Now this contact can be just a connection shortcut or it can be a weak link. If it is a weak link, namely just a, a piece of superconducting film which becomes normal when the current exceeds some critical value, then this is a squid a superconducting quantum interference device. And now why do I consider both cases? John Clem once asked me to calculate the case where there is no flux inside. This is a physically most sensible case because when you have here a shortcut and you have no applied field and now you apply a field and you are below TC, then the flux will stay zero here. So in the beginning there was no magnetic flux and now you increase the applied field but the superconductor screens the uh, magnetic field here. So there is no flux penetrating and this can be calculated only by using these two solutions, in both cases here, you have a flux. Here the flux comes from the magnetic field, the applied field penetrating here. And actually here the magnetic field is about three times larger than the applied field. So this is so-called flux focusing or, or field enhancement. And here you have a, a flux because you assume, this is just the assumption, you have a circulating current or a magnetic flux which is screened by such a current. So you have magnetic flux in this and in this case, this case. And now you add these two solutions with opposite sign and with a weight such that these two fluxes just compensate and then you get this solution. So this solution is a linear superposition of this. And these equations show how I calculate this. Now the current is no longer a scalar in going in one direction, but it has two components. But since the divergence of current density is always exactly zero, it's zero when you have no contacts. Therefore, in, in this situation, right, I have to, I lose. Uh, therefore, you can write the current density, this two component sheet current density, actually, it's the current density integrate over sickness, in terms of a scalar function g. So this is the y derivative and the x derivative, they give these two components. And this so-called stream function uh, can be used to do calculation. You also need a, an inverse matrix and so on. So this, this works. And the main parameter is the, the, this two-dimensional magnetic penetration depth. And now, uh, well, yeah, you, you get now various uh, pictures, for instance. This is a situation when you have no applied field, but what does this penetrate here? At, at this point. And then the magnetic field lines of, of a pair of waters it looks like this. This follows all from this theory. Uh, okay. So, and something, yeah, yeah, okay. And now I come to the next point. I don't have much time left. The dissipation by moving vortices. So, a Lorentz force acts on vortices when you apply a current and just this is a force on one vortex. And the Lorentz force density is the same, but m times the density of vortices. So the phi zero becomes B, the induction. And the velocity is then assumed to be just proportional to the force. So it's so-called drag coefficient or 
it's also called viscosity. Also, it's not a real viscosity. It's just the coefficient of proportionality between